G'day, guys. We're on the line with Caligula's Horse lead guitarist, Sam Vallon. Cheers for speaking with me, mate. Not a problem at all, Cameron. So let's get straight into it and kick things off by talking a little bit about your new album, In Contact. Uh, just a few days away till its release. Uh, you've got to be getting pretty excited now. Oh, incredibly excited, man. Like, I, I mean, a lot of people who hear this stuff don't realise just how much time goes into the lead-up. You know, we've been we've been waiting to get this out for months now, so it's super exciting. Oh, awesome. So th- this is your fourth album, and obviously you guys have been rising the ranks in popularity for years now. Um, are you starting to feel a bit of pressure, but like either p- p- during the writing process or just prior to the release of it? Um, I'd, I'd say we are. I mean, in in some ways, you could almost see this as kind of our sophomore album, being that it's our second album on a label. You know, it's the second label, uh, sorry, second album that we know is going to have that kind of big push and big sort of more global, I suppose, expectation behind it. So yeah, there's a bit of pressure, but again, you know, I'm pretty confident with it. I think it should be. I think it should keep people happy. I guess we will just have to see. Well, I've had a little sneaky of the album, and I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, it's bloody amazing. Um, oh, like, awesome. Thank it, you. Even for a Caligula's Horse album, it's like extremely complex piece of work. Um, did it evolve into that, or did you guys go into the writing process knowing it was going to be like a four-piece pe- four epic monster? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the concept definitely took a bit of a life of its own um, as, as, we, as we put it together, but... I mean, we, we sort of have this mindset going into every album where uh, we, we're, we're very explicit that we want to make sure that it contrasts the last one in some way. So with Bloom, it was going to be sort of bright and vivid and colourful as opposed to uh, the Tide Thief and River's End before it, which was, you know, a fairly dark concept album. When it came to writing this album, we, we had a sit down and we, we sort of thought, OK, how do we contrast from Bloom? How can we build upon that without repeating ourselves and while also sort of maintaining a tangible sense of progression, a, a trajectory from that last album. So we decided the best way we could approach it was by making the dynamics even greater, you know, how, how much heavier can it be, how much lighter can it be, uh, how much more can we play with the sort of the instrumental possibilities in this band. Of course, it's based around uh, a time when we've got two new members, both of whom have incredible technical ability. So... Yeah, I mean, it was definitely intentional to some degree. We we knew that we wanted to create something that felt bigger and more grand than before, but at the same time, it's it is kind of a natural step for us as well. It's fairly holistic. You know, see, see, to to to, to a fan and just you know a basic guitarist like me, just imagining <laughs> trying to put all that together is mind-boggling. Like. What, what do you do? How do you break it down into parts? Like, are you going home and writing a riff, and, and are you building on it like that, or like honestly, how do you do this? <laughs> no, that's that's a, that's a great question because the thing is, we've actually got a pretty consistent uh, creative approach to the way we do it. That's that's Jim and I, Jim Jim Gray, our singer. We usually just uh, like I'll I'll come up with a riff. It can be as simple as that. I'll come up with the I'll come up with a riff, or I'll come up with a, a chord progression, or something that I think has some kind of musical merit. I'll chuck it up in a Pro Tools session and I'll start manipulating it, you know, programming parts to it, layering it up until it starts to take some kind of actual musical shape. And from the very beginning, Jim and I will get together and start workshopping melodies, start working out where that would fit structurally, trying to take as uh, as top-down a view as possible of the song as we write it. So it's not just a bunch of ideas thrown together. It's It's something that sort of makes sense as a whole. But in terms of the parts, I mean... Graves, for example, the last song on the album, it's, you know, it's something with a scope that we haven't really touched on before um, in Caligula's Horse. And that was definitely something that creatively was fairly overwhelming. I mean, I, I still remember that after writing something like that, it took us, I think, about two or three months to put that together. Um, after finishing it, it threw me into a spiralling sort of uh, writer's block. I wasn't really <laughs> able to do anything after because it was just such an intense project, you know? Well, that's, yeah, that's um, something like yeah. a... Yeah. Sorry, sorry, go on. No, you're right. That's 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 basically it. So, I mean, our, our creative process is pretty much the same each time, but you know how it how it comes together is always based on where we hear the ideas going in a more objective sense. Like it's never throwing shit at a wall, you know. <laughs> we sit there and we, we play with it until we think it's actually going to be something good. <laughs> So on the opposite end of that, we say especially something like Grey's, which is something like what a sixteen minute monster in itself. Minutes, yeah. Entirely too long. That's entirely it. Too long, how yes. how do you know when a song's finished? Like, you know, you can you can obviously keep adding to it and then yeah, how do you at what point do you go, right, that that's the song, what's the next one? 
That's a, that's a great question because, I mean, when you listen to In Contact especially, I mean, even more so than our previous albums, there's a lot of songs on the record that are actually fairly sparse as well. Like, I mean, you know, Graves is obviously the opposite. It's, you know, hundreds of tracks in my session when I put that mix together. It's, it's, it's mad. But on the other hand, you could have something like Capulet, which is really just an acoustic guitar, some drums, bass, vocal, and some very sparse keyboards, you know, like, I think, I think it's done once it sort of fulfills that idea that I was describing in the creative process that we, we sort of try to tap into straight away. If you can put something into a session, into a Pro Tools session, into Guitar Pro, however it is that you write, everyone does it in a different way. If you can tap into what that's going to be at the very beginning, not necessarily how it's going to be as a fully formed thing, but what kind of vibe, what kind of atmosphere it's going to convey, then it's pretty easy to tell when you've achieved that. So it's pretty rare that we run into those kind of crises of, oh, you know, can I keep going with this? Can it become more detailed, more intricate? Usually it's a little bit simpler than that. It's, it's, it's as soon as it conveys that emotion that we've tried to tap into at the start, we're usually pretty happy. And, I mean, it's telling that Jim and I usually arrive at the same conclusion, you know. <laughs> at some point we both say, yeah, man, this is this is it. Let's, Absolutely. Let's get the guys to learn it. <laughs> yeah. So the world's already had a chance to hear a couple of songs from the album. How, how's the response yes. been? The response has been amazing. Um, Will's song was an interesting one to drop first because obviously it's, well, I mean, I'd, I'd probably say it's possibly our heaviest song. If not, it's definitely up there. Um, and I think it's sort of, as much as the reception is really good, I know there were a bunch of fans that were a little bit worried that it was going to be, you know, a really, really metal album. Uh, and it is here and there, but it's not entirely dominated by that. On the other hand, Songs for No One's kind of the opposite. You know, it's fairly sort of colourful and fairly gentle, if dense. I know those sort of seem like they're mutually incompatible, but that's kind of what we were going for. Um, and the reception to both have been awesome. I think people are already getting the idea that the album is going to be varied because of those two extremes. Absolutely. Well, I'm loving the uh, the ec- bit of extra ferocity that you've added to it, um, and I cannot mm. wait to see it live. Um, their tour for this album starts off at the end of this month in Perth. Yeah. So uh, how many tracks from the album are you going to be playing, do you reckon? <laughs> we get, I, okay, I don't want to spoil it too much, but we're definitely going to be playing a few. Awesome. Uh, we're going to play – I'll, I'll tell you. We're going to do three songs off the new album, but we're also going to bring back a couple of songs that we've never played off some of the older albums. So it's going to be a pretty varied set list. I think people are going to be kind of surprised, actually, at some of the stuff that we're doing. But, yeah, there's going to be quite a, quite a bit uh, in terms of – minutes of the new material if that is any hint um three songs <laughs> awesome awesome i can't wait i cannot wait uh and as well as you guys you've put on a bunch of killer supports in all the different states um do you guys have much of a say in that or is that something that's just sort of presented to you oh no we're, we're, we're super plugged into it i mean I think it's true for us, but it also seems to be true for a lot of Australian bands. We're really interested in the scene, you know. It's like it's tight-knit enough that we follow everyone that we're interested in, and when it comes time to tour, those are the bands that we get on board. Um, I built this guy as a band who I I think are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, You know, incredible riffs, way too technical, blows my mind in that kind of capacity. Love the music. And when it comes to the local supports, we're always really keen to find out who are the up-and-coming bands in each city, you know. These are the bands that we've either heard, we've come across, we've seen live, we've heard from friends are amazing. Um, But there's no band on these tours, uh, or really any tours that we'll do, that we haven't, you know, we haven't okayed, I suppose. Oh, that's awesome. And as well as yeah. helping local bands, you guys are also, you know, you're regularly coming to places like here in Adelaide, whereas, you know, a lot of bands skip us and, you know, we, we obviously appreciate mm. that. But what do you think of the Aussie scene on a whole and what? how do you think we are going to attract more people into places like Perth and Tasmania and Adelaide? Well, I mean, there's always going to be a disadvantage at the start just the fact that places like Tasmania and Adelaide and, you know, you could even say places like Darwin and stuff, they're, they're just cities that don't have a huge population. You know, it's, if you're a big international touring band and your bottom line is like, you know, the difference between thousands of dollars and a day being overseas, then it might be kind of impossible, as sad as it is. But the fact is, like, we never skip a place like Adelaide, especially. I mean, I've got a ton of family in Adelaide, which makes it cool to come down. But we never skip a city like Adelaide because we know that, the, you know, we know that the people there are ready for shows. We know they come out. 
we've always had a great crowd there. We've always got along really well with the local scene, heaps of mates there. It, you know, it, it would seem crazy for us to not do it. But at the same time, I, I can see I can see why it is difficult for the biggest bands to come and do that. I mean, you remember Dream Theater coming a couple of years ago and playing only Sydney and Melbourne, you know? Those yeah. kind of things are pretty common to do. And it's, I don't know, to be honest, it's, it's sad, but I guess that's just the state of affairs. Yeah, well, that's it. So uh, anyway, mate, just to finish up, there's a lot of young guitarists out there that look up to you. Uh, what advice would you have for them, like just on improving their technique or maybe a bit of songwriting or, you know, whatever they want to do? Yeah, well, when I was when I was coming up, um, you know, I was sort of as, as obsessive as any young shredder sitting in my room with a metronome and all that kind of stuff. And I'd sort of resigned myself maybe at, you know, 16 or 17 to basically spending all of the time with my instrument practicing, you know, getting better at technical things, getting better at licks and whatever else. And it really wasn't until I was maybe in my late teens or early 20s that I started focusing in the foremost on songwriting. And I think having that little bit of a gap was was possibly detrimental. What I'd suggest is that musicality should definitely be the first thing on anyone's mind when it comes to guitar playing. I mean, at the end of the day, guitar is really only a facilitator of the music that you're creating. It's not the not the thing itself. It's the tool that creates the thing. So my advice to any young guitarist is don't overlook those things. Spend as much time as you can soaking up music and composition as much as you do the shred. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. <laughs> that is awesome advice. Oh, well, thank you very much for speaking with me, Sam. Uh, good luck with the album release and can't wait to see you thank here you. in Adelaide at the end of the month. Awesome. I'll see you there.